is our work on the phase structure of QCD with functional methods. And I'm speaking on behalf of the FQCD collaboration. And you see the current members here. It's located Brookhaven, Dalian, Darmstadt, and Heidelberg. And uh, it's a larger initiative to really crunch down quantitatively uh, functional renormalization group flows for QCD at large density. So what are the methods? I mean, uh, Christian has already given a very nice introduction to Dyson Schwinger equations. I now will introduce another functional methods, which is related, but not the same. This is the functional renormalization group. And there, instead of looking at uh, the quantum equation of motion of the theory, the Dyson Schwinger equation, we look at a coarse gray theory. So we introduce an infrared cut of scale, which we usually call K to our generating functional, which is you can interpret the free energy in the presence of arbitrary background field files. And then we, in, first of all, we suppress all the infrared up to a very large scale there in QCD. We have a good grip on this object here by perturbation theory. And then we successively lower this momentum scale and integrate our momentum shells one by one. So it's a Wilsonian RG setting we are talking here about. Now, if we write down the scale derivative, so the cutoff scale derivative of this effective action, it has a very simple one loop form. So here we have the scale derivative of the generating function of correlation functions. So if we take derivatives with respect to quarks, gluons, hadrons, we just get correlation functions. And T is just nothing but the logarithm of the cutoff scale divided by some reference scale. And this is an exact formula. So what we have here is, for example, a full gluon loop. That's a full gluon two-point function in the presence of arbitrary backgrounds. And this cross and circle just means that we are integrating out a momentum shell here. So there are no higher diagrams. That's all. Of course, it's a very complicated equation because um, these are full correlation functions. You should also not think because I have here a loop for hadron fluctuations. So this is actually should indicate a quark and an antiquark. So actually it's a meson loop that this indicates an effective theory. We just take the liberty of reparametrizing our theory and in particular resonant for quark interaction channels in terms of effective fields. But there's a one-to-one -one map. So you, I mean, a well-defined map from the action in the presence of these effective fields to the QCD action where these fields are integrated out. So it's a closed form. It's very similar to a Dyson Schwinger equation. Now, just for comparison to what Christian has done on Monday, I put down the Dyson Schwinger equation for QCD. So you see the similarities. So these three diagrams look the same as these three diagrams here. Of course, there's a derivative because the Dyson Schwinger equation involves a derivative with respect to the field, but apart from this, it looks the same or it looks similar. The two loop terms you have in the Dyson Schwinger equation are not present here. Okay, so what we are now aiming in this approach to uh, QCD, and Christian has already mentioned it, we are aiming at apparent convergence. And I will explain what we mean by this. So, uh, it can be best seen in vacuum QCD. And I'm not only using this as an example, but I also use it because we use it as input for our flows at finite temperature and density. So what we have done here is a rather elaborate approximation to this full set of equations I have written down before. Um, so at the very end, if I take derivatives of uh, the functional flow equations, I get loop equations, loop relations for correlation functions. These are one loop exact. But all the vertices and propagators in these loop relations are simply the full propagators and vertices. And what I'm talking here about is the approximation we have been we have used in two flavor QCD in the vacuum to solve the theory. And by solving, I mean we put in a strong coupling at a large momentum scale, and everything is integrated out. There are no infrared parameters. We are not tuning to anything on the lattice or whatsoever. We are simply solving it in this approximation. And all the correlation functions you see here are also fed back to the loops. So we're not 
taking some as input and then computing an integral, we are really solving the full set of coupled equations for these objects here. Since it's important to understand this apparent conversions, let me walk through it. We have the gluon sector, and I will keep this color coding. Of course, we have the gluon propagator. We have a gauge fixed approach. It's Landau gauge, so we have also ghost. And then we have vertices. And if you have a large blob here, which means full vertices with general tensor structures and dressings for these tensor structures, OK? So here, for the purely gluonic vertices, we took only the classical tensor structures because we can show that the other tensor structures are indeed subleading. Now, here you have the matter sector, the standard quark glue sector. We have the quark propagator. We have the full quark gluon vertex, and we take it into account fully, which means in QCD, it has eight transverse tensor structures. And all these tensor structures have dressing, which depend on P and Q, so on the external four momenta. And then we have further vertices, which we have to take into account because of gauge invariance. And then very importantly, there is the full four quark vertex. And this has in two flavor QCD, 10 uh, momentum independent tensor structures. And we take those tensor structures into account and we solve the momentum dependence. Since we also, what we call dynamical hadronization, introduce this effective fields for resonant parts of this interaction, we also have a propagator for these resonant fields. And what we are taking is actually the uh, scalar, pseudo-scalar multiplet. And we have multi-scattering of essentially these resonant interaction channels, which would be multi-scatterings of resonant quarks. And that is the full approximation we consider. It's an elaborate system. And we have also quite some consistency checks that this is actually indeed, I mean, coming close to apparent convergence. And I would like to also now tell you about the results. So first, the simplest correlation functions, because they pop up everywhere, which is the, um, the quark and gluon propagators. These are our results. This is in the vacuum, so we can compare them to lattice results. So here you see our gluon propagator. It's actually the dressing function. So p squared times the gluon propagator in comparison to lattice results. Uh, don't get confused here. That is a lattice artifact. So this is full perturbation theory. So we are bang on the lattice results. Here you see the quark propagator. It's actually a more delicate quantity also because of the resonant interaction channels. But also here we are on the results. The red, um, the red area are our estimates for systematic errors. And if you are interested, of course, we can discuss this at the very end. Now. Uh, one thing which I want to emphasize here, these are simple uh, correlations. They don't have fancy momentum dependencies. That's good for us because our approach works better if the momentum dependencies are not that crazy. Okay. So if we see very um, intricate momentum dependencies in correlation functions, we simply have to go to higher correlation functions in order to see this apparent convergence. Now, Let's go to another correlation function, which maybe is more interesting. It's the quark gluon vertex. And that's, of course, driving the matter sector. As I said, it has eight transverse tensor structures. And all of these tensor structures depend on two four momenta. I pick out one, which is the leading one, which is actually the classical tensor structure. And it has a dressing lambda 1, p, and q. And here, I just take you, I give you a snapshot for a specific angle of this tensor st structure lambda 1, p, and q. But we have it fully. And of course, we have all a tensor structures. Again, you see, it's very simple. It looks boring, but that's good for us. Because if it would have a very intricate momentum dependence, then we would have to go to higher um, approximations in order to really see apparent convergence. And we are not the only ones doing this. This is work with uh, Anton Sirol, Mario Mitter, and Niels Schrotthoff from 2017. But here, I listed a couple of uh, works with functional methods and also with uh, lattice methods, which of course we very much like in order to check our results in particular in the vacuum. Okay, so now what do we do at final density? Well, there obviously we have to up our game a bit. And what we are now doing is we take this quantitative results from the vacuum and we expand our equations about this. And I will give you, I want to give you a bit of feeling of what we are doing. So if you have a correlation functions. So this is an endpoint correlation functions. We write it as some input. 
we will use the two flavor vacuum results I have just explained, but we could also take lattice input or Dyson Schwinger input. Okay, that's actually an advantage of this method. If you have quantitative input, you simply can do it. And then we write down a functional RG equation for the rest. And this RG equation will just be given by the RG equation of the input, but that's input. And then there is a flow equation for the rest, and it depends on the input, which we know, and again, on this difference between the input and the full correlation function. So we can set up flow equations for such a rest in a well-defined way. And now the good thing is that if we have reasons and arguments to believe that we need a worse truncation to get our hands on this, input, on this rest of the correlation functions, we can use it, okay? So the systematics is for the input, you go as far as you can go with your system. And then for the rest, you can relax a bit. But relax a bit does not mean it's not difficult. Okay, so the input we have used are the two flavor vacuum QCD results. We have also final temperature and mills results, which we also use. Okay, and then we have solved two flavor QCD at finer temperature and density. And that's the results I would like to present at the very end. And that is joint work together with Veji Fu from Dalian and Fabian Rennicke um, from Brookhaven. And we have published this, I put this on the net, September of 2019. Okay, so again, we keep essentially uh, the approximation we have here, but we assume more trivial tensor structures. In particular, we only took into account for the delta gamma, so the final temperature and density fluctuations, uh, the classical tensor structures. And I will come to these limitations later. Still, we have the um, dynamical hadronization. So we take into account pions, pion channel and sigma channels in our um, approximation. Now, more recently, let's work with Fei Gao, uh, at the moment uh, postdoc in, in Heidelberg. We have also done this for Dyson Schwinger equations. So here you have the same framework. You have a uh, Dyson Schwinger equation for the rest, which depends on the input, and then a rest Dyson Schwinger equation, which again depends on the input and on what you want to compute. And here again, we took the results of vacuum QCDs. That's why we called it FRG assisted Dyson Schwinger equation. But keep in mind, we can use any quantitative input somebody gives us. But here, the results I want to um, uh, show you are fully functional. So we have solved vacuum QCD on the basis of putting in a strong coupling. There's no phenol input. And then we are going on at finer density. So the Dyson Schwinger equation we have used here are those for the quark propagator, the gluon propagator, the full quark gluon vertex again, all A tensor structures. And since the Dyson Schwinger equation have um, one classical vertex as input, we need also the classical vertex. So that's the system of Dyson Schwinger equation we have looked at. We have taken also an approximation to the Dyson Schwinger equation for the quark gluon vertex. The next step will be that we also include these terms here, which actually we can again read off here in vacuum two flavor QCD and then expand about this. Okay, so let's come to benchmarks. And Christian also has talked about benchmarks. It's not only benchmark because um, he has emphasized and maybe this um, was not that visible that they computed the two flavor uh, gluon propagator at finer temperature and that was at the, at the point where the lattice did not have results there. And then the lattice essentially were on top of these results, okay? So this was a prediction from functional methods and the lattice confirmed this. Now here I'm talking about benchmark results. So our input is essentially the dash curve, which is bang on the lattice results, as I said. And now this is our result for the two plus one flavor gluon propagator. And again, it's bang on the lattice results. We can see the same here for the Dyson Schwinger curve. And now, of course, we can also compare at a uh, finer temperature, which is here. So you see I'm changing around Dyson Schwinger and FIG results. So at finer temperature in the vacuum, we are in quantitative agreement with the lattice results. Okay, so now we go on. 
and look at the chiral condensate. So now we are getting more physical because we need the chiral condensate in order to um, determine um, our phase boundary. So here again, this is the Dyson Schwinger result from this work here, very recent, last uh, month. And it's again in agreement that's at finer temperature now with lattice results. Okay, so you have seen this result already with, uh, for the results of Christian Fischer. It's the same there. But now we can go to finer density. And you can see here we can go to arbitrarily finer uh, 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 large densities. Of course, we have limitations concerning our systematic error, and I will explain this in a second. Okay, so that's how we get our. Um, phase boundary, we take the reduced chiral condensate, the definition is here, it's maybe not that important, also the one which is taken on the lattice, and we look at the susceptibilities and our crossover temperature chiral one is just the peak of the susceptibility. On the lattice, um, sorry, the renormalized condensate, on the lattice uh, quite often also the reduced condensate is taken, here you see our shot on the reduced condensate, again where the lattice has results, it's in agreement with the lattice results, but we can go to finer density. Okay, now let's come to the first main result. That's our phase structure from our methods. So what you see here, we are in agreement with the lattice results. So here are the wuppertal budapest results and the hot QCD results and where the lattice can compute, we are fully in agreement, quantitatively in agreement with our phase boundary with the lattice results. However, we can go on. You still see um, limits here. And for quite a while, our limit for our, I mean, having a relatively small systematic error was mu b over t is three, which depends on which channel we took into account and so on. But I will go, I will walk you through an error analysis uh, in a second. Okay, so now you see, um, also here the result of Christian Fischer in his group. And these are, first of all, the blue one is our FRG result. And the black one is our results from Dyson Schwinger equation. From this, late, from this work here, we had the first shot on the, shot on the face diagram where we took slapnev taylor identity assisted vertices. And you see, I mean, <clears throat> that there is actually quite a change here, but nevertheless, we see this convergence, okay? So I have not put in any other results for models or older Dyson Schwinger equations, because in my opinion, that is the state of the art. So you know that there's, there's this old plot of Stefanov from 2004, where I mean, you have this uh, regime here in mu b and t and the results uh, essentially covered all the plane. I did not like this uh, plot even then because, I mean, these were mostly model results, but some of the models were tuned for different purposes and not for giving a prediction for the critical endpoint. So even there, I would say, I mean, the models that were designed for doing larger chemical potential showed the critical endpoint further out, but that is now confirmed here. Okay, so if you now look at the most recent Dyson Schwinger and FRG results, the critical endpoints are actually rather close. Okay? And that is what we get if you take the full, all tensor structures of the quark Lewin vertex into account. But keep in mind the resummations which is done by these two functional equations are rather different. So that's a non trivial systematics check on our methods. Okay? So let's walk. Uh, okay, these are things, a curvature is fine with the lattice, but as I said, this is the area beyond the reliability bound, which we put down also in the papers. But let's walk through the reliability. What could go wrong? Of course, which presumably you haven't seen is that in this FRG computation, we only took into account um, <clears throat> the scalar pseudo scalar channel in the four quark interactions. Now we know from a nice work of Jens Braun and collaborators from last year that this is a very good uh, a quantitative approximation for small densities. That's the pseudo scalar scalar channel and it dominates by far. You can even switch on and off these channels here and nothing changes. However, at some chemical potential, the dominance order changes rapidly 
to a color superconductivity, color su superconducting channel, right? So a dipole channel. Okay, and of course, our approximation for this region here is not trustworthy anymore. This is to flavor in the chiral limit, so one has to uh, go through uh, the analogy with two plus one flavor a bit, but if you um, map this to two plus one flavor QCD, that would say presumably from, if, if I'm very conservative, from mu b over t is four on, one should take into account other channels. So the estimate you get here is actually mu b over t is bigger than five, but I want to be conservative. That's what I mean with conservative estimate. Now, there's another nice work with the Dyson Schwinger equation. Uh, Christian mentioned it, that if you take into account baryons, there are only minor changes. I mean, the baryons are of course related to the, um, uh, to the diquarks. So maybe for the critical point, this does not, is not that important. The, the, the next thing is, however, of course, I mean, it asks for fits complete computation. So taking all channels into account for this uh, QCD flows and we are on it at the moment. The other thing is you may have seen this hash area here. There, uh, the um, pion dispersion has a non-trivial minimum and the core condensate, so the QQ bar condensate is sizable. So we see this as an indication for something non-trivial happening. We say quotation mark inhomogeneous phase, it may be inhomogeneous phase. It simply indicates that something uh, non-trivial is going on. And of course we have to up our, our game also here to take this into account. So in the very end, this simply means that for mu b over t is larger than four, because if you see the intersection of this area with the blue line, it's essentially mu b over t is larger than four. We have to be um, more precise, but that in turn means that our um, critical point estimate from FRG and Dyson Schwinger equation essentially is this area here. Okay. Four, four minutes. Yes. Now, as I said, above mu b over t is four. Um, we have to improve our computations, but I would say stay tuned. I think in the now, next couple of years, you will get a quantitative estimate from our um, function methods groups for the location of the critical endpoint. And if I say location, I just mean the point from which on something non-trivial happens, like critical endpoint, left Lifshitz point, um, non-trivial phases, and so on and so on, okay? So maybe I also just glance through some applications we also did with uh, um, our numerics. The first is the magnetic equation of state. So um, looking at um, the chiral limit, I mean, Friedhoff mentioned this uh, yesterday also in a, in a talk. So we did our own shot on this. Here you see our results in comparison with the lattice curves from the HQCD collaboration, we consider this to be um, compatible with each other. One uh, thing actually we see, because we have a very good grip on critical scaling is for quark masses, uh, for pion masses larger than 25 MeV, we don't see any critical scaling. But I would also like to mention here, I mentioned this uh, paper yesterday in the astrophysics section. I was a bit surprised that this was not mentioned because this is a combined study of the equation of state. Well, it's just symmetric nuclear matter, but it actually doesn't even make it worse. And if you compare the FRG with and without dipole channels, there is quite a difference. So perturbation theory is this curve here. If you take into account the dipole channel, you are here. So I think this should be taken into account um, in upgraded model computations. Another one is, I also mentioned this, this is why I put it in. Of course, there's FRG work on the equation of state for quark or neutron stars. And also there you see, this is the FRG curves. So there's quite some difference to mean field models. So I think this is interesting and should be taken into account actually in, in further works. Now, since this was asked, I will just glance over it. Some applications, fluctuations of conserved charges. So that's our shot on fluctuations of conserved charges. That's again at mu is zero. 
And you see, we have quite a good agreement with the lattice results. That's now not full QCD flows. That's a so-called QCD assisted low energy effective theory. We use QCD input, flow input, and only solve for quark and meson fluctuations. That's what we are doing here. So it builds on some work, previous work we have done in this low energy effective models. And this is now our shot on hyper fluctuations. That's the work in preparation with the Darien group and Fabian and also Wuhan, you see uh, Yuxin Luo here from the STAR collaboration. So that is um, our estimate for hyper fluctuations. And since uh, Heng Tong asked this yesterday, I um, got a new result. So that's why the color coding is not correct. I mean, it should be green because it's uh, freeze out curve star two. Uh, that's actually something Shi Yin did on the spot from yesterday to today. So here is your uh, result for R51. Okay. So let me come to the summary. I hope I have convinced you that we are really now up to the game. We are coming towards the parent convergence in function approaches to QCD. We can use this to get our hands on the phase structure of QCD at large densities. I told you there are systematic approximations underway for this region here. And actually we need it for mu v over t is larger than four. I have just flashed fluctuations of conserved charges. Also there we have ongoing computations in the full setup and uh, we hope to have results uh, soon there. And I also just want to mention that this allows us also to do non-equilibrium investigations, heavy ion collisions is a non-equilibrium process because we in the meantime have the possibility to also work out time-like or real-time correlation functions and use them for transport and transport coefficients. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jan, uh, for the talk. Are there any questions? Let me see, two participants raised their hands. I have to figure out which ones. Um, which button do I click to see that? Ah, here. Yeah. Uh, Nuska is the first one. Uh, okay. In usual renormalization group, uh, we have uh, as a running parameters alpha and uh, masses of quarks. Uh, in that term, we know where is the critical points. This is the zeros of the beta function. Uh, if you show uh, or extract from your functional renormalization group, we also may uh, classify uh, critical points or phase transition points. In your functional uh, renormalization group uh, description, what singularities or characteristics of the solutions corresponds to phase, phase transitions? How you classify uh, your critical properties uh, and corresponding phase uh, description? Okay. So here, I mean, this is a functional renormalization group. So we have a renormalization group really for correlation functions. But also how we classify, if you wish, this critical point here, what you see here is the chiral condensate. And what we are looking at is, uh, first of all, we are looking at fluctuations. And if the fluctuations uh, have singularities, this indicates a critical point. But if you look at this chiral condensate here, a phase transition is, of course, uh, characterized by this condensate going to zero. And that is something we can very well look at. That's actually one of the first applications of the, the functional renormalization group, which was done. We take a five to the four theory and look at uh, the flow of the order parameter. So what we have okay. here is really the order parameter. It's critical scaling. So you have all, all the parameters and yeah. by them in the yeah. condensate, yeah. for example. So we, and we, that that parameter so characteristics are secondary as uh, you have effective action you already always may derive corresponding uh, quantities for all the parameters right yeah. 
Okay. But uh, so, anyway, alpha, behavior of alpha. Yeah, I, I propose we, we uh, continue a more technical discussion, maybe in a discussion session or, or privately. Okay. Let's just okay. ask one more very quick question. Uh, Michael Bubala was second. Okay, yeah, I have a, a brief comment and, and, and also a short question. So the, the, the comment is simply according to this inhomogeneous region, you mentioned that uh, the pion has a, a non-trivial behavior. And uh, we somehow saw that the more relevant correlator is the sigma correlator to look at. So maybe, I don't know whether you have looked at that as well. Well, and, uh, the, the sig you see it's a multiplex. So the, uh, the dispersion we have is both the pion and the, the sigma. So the sigma also has a non-trivial dispersion. OK. I mean, in the chiral limit, of course, it doesn't matter, but, uh, but, if you go but look, I mean, I, I'm very, I mean, we called it inhomogeneous uh, uh, because, I mean, uh, you need some term. But uh, so for me, it simply indicates something non trivial is going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, it, it, sure, it's not yet. So don't misunderstand it. I mean, it would be very nice to have an inhomogeneous region there, mm -hmm. but. Um, my, my question my question concerns uh, the quark luon vertex. Unfortunately, I, I missed uh, Christian's talk on, on Monday because of my lectures. Uh, but I remember, uh, at least in the past, they always had some kind of model ansatz for the quark luon uh, vertex. And so I was wondering whether you could compare your results with that. Yes. So what we take actually into account are all tensor structures called dressing functions fully. And this already allows us, I mean, that's what we had in the vacuum QCD computation. We don't need any uh, infrared tuning of this. And it's actually, uh, I mean, you can also see that is what we saw in this work and we saw again, there are three relevant tensor structures which you have to take into account, which already reduces the work because if you have to feed back eight tensor structures with non-trivial dressings in your flow equations, you will have a lot of fun. Well, maybe not you, but the students, but uh, so it, it, it's, it's quite some work, okay? So, and that's the difference to what Christian did. And I mean, I also made an analysis um, uh, for, for you, you see, if you look at Christian's result, they are in quantitative agreement here, but if you look at the curvature, it's a bit too high. And that, in my opinion, comes from this ansatz. So if you readjust this, you can even, we did this, I mean, we, we discussed this, you can map this curve up here. Okay, okay I propose we, we stop and we can discuss the critical endpoint, which is definitely of interest in the discussion session further. And so the final question that is standing, please save your question for later in the afternoon then. So thanks Jan again for the, the talk.